Some films were harmed in the making of this podcast. For your consideration, the podcast featuring roundtable discussion, reevaluating the cinematic canon of past masterpieces and modern classics. I'm your host, Dustin Friesman. And I'm Mike Josek. Welcome to the show. So this week on For Your Consideration, we are going to be talking about the 1980 satire comedy Airplane. A.K.A. that movie that is exactly like Jaws in every single way, except for all the ways in which it is not at all like Jaws, which is basically all of them. It's been a while since we've done a comedy on the show. Uh, I Actually, I think the Marx Brothers might have been the last straight full comedy that we've done, Duck Soup. Minus anything we mentioned in uh, All Things Considered. Touche. Uh, so yeah, when Dustin suggested Airplane as a, a movie that we could do, I was all over that. It's been probably 30 years since I've seen the movie. I used to be a huge fan of this movie as a kid. And I've seen bits and pieces, but I'm not sure I've actually seen the whole thing in just one go. And when Dustin found out that it's actually listed on the Sight and Sound, uh, Greatest Films of All Time, I was like, let's do it. (laughs) Sold. So here we are. I'll roll the credits on the movie, and then we can get to the discussion phase of the show. So Airplane was directed by Jim Abrams, David Zucker, and Jerry Zucker. It was produced by John Davison, written by Jim Abrams, David Zucker, and Jerry Zucker. It starred Robert Hayes, Julie Haggerty, Robert Stack, Peter Graves. I'm reading off a list here that isn't listing like all the amazing... Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Leslie Nielsen, (laughs) Lloyd Bridges. I was actually surprised when I saw it initially that Leslie Nielsen wasn't even in the list until he went to show everyone. (laughs) Well, this was the movie that kind of broke him as like the comedy actor. But anyways... Music was by Elmer Bernstein, cinematography by Joseph Birock, edited by Patrick Kennedy. It was distributed by Paramount Pictures and released on July 2nd, 1980. The film is quite lauded in the critical community. It rates as the 546th greatest film of all time on the Sight and Sound Director's Poll. Empire Magazine voted it 368 on their 500 best spoofs ever. How many spoofs are there that it's only 368 is my question. AFI has it as number 10 on its 10 funniest movies of all time. The magazine Total Film rated it the second greatest comedy film of all time. And Channel 4's Greatest Comedy Films poll ranks Airplane as second behind Monty Python's The Life of Brian. Which is also on sight and sound and I hope to sneak in at some point. Oh, there'll be no sneaking. We'll probably just do like a whole month of Python or something one day. (laughs) (laughs) One day. One day a month. So with that out of the way... Into the discussion uh, segment of the program. Dustin, what did you think of Airplane? My first thought of the movie was, of course, the whole uh, Jaws bit that I did for the Demery, and that is they really show you exactly what kind of movie it's going to be within 10 seconds of it starting, and that was great. (laughs) With the whole airplane fin just going back and forth and the Jaws music playing, you know exactly what it is you're watching. There is no question about it. And, of course, they keep up jokes non-stop throughout the uh throughout the film i read a a calculation that there's 2.8 jokes per minute in this movie and that is if you catch them all i know there was one that both of us almost missed where uh (laughs) the classified information (laughs) yeah they're on the beach rolling around making out and it's like i got a ship off i'm going to bomb this specific depot we're going in from the north and this day oh when will you be back that's classified like i didn't I almost didn't catch that. You started laughing and I was like going over what I'd heard. I was like, that is a good joke. (laughs) I think the brilliance of that moment too is that that scene is a spoof of From Here to Eternity. So you're kind of watching it as a spoof and you're not thinking that there's going to be another joke layered in there. You're just thinking, oh, it's a parody. It's, you know, they're riffing on that scene that everybody knows from that famous movie. So to have him do that line, yeah. It just I do like that they hide so many jokes very subtly within things. And because it's a 
a spoof that does very straight faced act acting and reacting i love always how that works where you can have the nonsense going on but people play it straight it always seems to work better and a bit funnier to me than if uh, people always react huge to everything and it's something that i don't see much anymore i don't think the really nice thing here, like you brought up the the huge, like over exaggerated stuff and the straight faced humor. This movie balances both. It, it it puts the two together in the same room and lets them play together. And that's one of the, the magic ingredients, I think, to this movie, because it's not like watching freaking Billy Madison or something where it's just Adam Sandler running around for half an hour or an hour and a half going. Rah, 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 and you're like, OK, that's supposed to be funny, I guess. <laughs> You've got that, like, you've got Johnny running around going, there's a sale at pennies, or whatever else. You can make a pterodactyl, or a brooch, or whatever. But in that exact same exchange, you've got Lloyd Bridges sitting there and delivering everything just totally straight-faced, and Robert Stack coming in and just whipping off that second pair of sunglasses because the first one was hiding the second in his... I think balance, the balance of the humor... Because this really does have just about everything. It's got slapstick. It's got sight gags. Relies heavily on puns. So many <laughs> puns. Which they bring back over and over again. It has uh, parody, uh, satire. Uh, there's so much in here that in 1980 would have been really relevant. You know, everything from the Jaws reference right out of the gate to the fact that it's riffing on the old disaster movies like Airplane 75. Uh, the film itself is more of a direct sort of parody of a movie called Zero Hour. And, you know, having Ethel Merman in there and having... Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as the pilot and riffing on his... Uh, whether or not he was good enough on the court. <laughs> There's the odd reference. Uh, you'll have them coming up beside doing the... Or checking the oil and all that full service of the airplane, which you don't tend to have anymore. I, I saw full service gas station once and it just confused the heck out of me. That's... <laughs> That's how young I am, I guess. <laughs> but then they were checking the credit card in the old credit card machine. They made a joke about one of the presidents. I forget which one. Gerald Ford, Gerald I Ford, think. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that is no longer relevant at all. And that's, that's one of the things that is hurting the movie a bit. Another one being uh, the amount of racial humor that I don't know how racist it is. So I wasn't too sure if, if I was being bad laughing at some of them. Some of them were just flat out bad, like uh, Israeli airlines, and they have a, a big old beard and a yarmulke on the plane. It's like, that's that's not good. And they'll have the Japanese general commit harikiri. The, uh, I love the Japanese newsroom, though, with the... <laughs> When they went with through the artwork the, down the side. When they went into all the different newsrooms. And the Polynesian <laughs> guy with the sticks. When they pass him the different sticks and he looks to the other camera. That was That was glorious. <laughs> but they'll have those other jokes in there where it's like the jive talking uh black guys and i i don't know how appropriate that is anymore <laughs> i think because that was something that i was aware of while watching the movie too i mean we were talking uh shortly after we finished it and i said i'm, I'm kind of conflicted because i sort of went in thinking i was going to go a certain way and then things like some of the body humor, some of the... Uh, that's body, B-A-W-D-Y. <laughs> Not B-O-D-Y. Uh, some of the body humor and uh, some of the more racially leaning humor. I was actually surprised to see uh, to see tits, really. At first, when Leslie Nielsen's looking at the uh, whacking material section of the magazines... <laughs> Fiction, And there's nudity right on there. Whacking I was material. Like, wow, I didn't expect that. <laughs> and then, of course, when everyone's panicking for no reason, a naked chick just runs in front of the camera. Did not expect that. This is a PG movie, too. And you know what? There's Nobody drops an F-bomb. Like, I think the hardest word in this movie is shit. I've, when the shit hits the fan. <laughs> ever si When I was a kid, that was one of the funniest things I'd ever seen in my life, when the shit hits the fan. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the, the whole leanings towards the slightly racial tinged humor and, and the body humor, it's there. And I think that's very 80s of the movie. But I kind of don't think that it crosses the line. Like it just it's 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 on the line and it's kind of leaning into the line. But I don't think it goes 
truly like tasteless or inappropriate. And one of the important things about it is, as you said, they go between all the forms of humor. They don't do a whole lot of it. It is few and far between. As you said, one joke every 2.8 seconds, pretty much. 2.8 jokes per minute. 2.8 jokes per minute. There you go. And then you, every 10 minutes, they might have one of these jokes, which is sort of pushing that envelope. So it's not inundating you with, all right, this whole movie is inappropriate. It's just a, a speckling here and there. And I think the Jive Talkers, for example, at the time in 1980, that might have been a little bit more relevant than it is now. But the and Jive... In the 90s and 2000s, it might have been ebonics or something like that talking street if that movie was made today that would be dudes talking like gangsters like rappers so that was something that i was kind of sensitive to while i was watching it and i was also thinking that it felt very much like a guy humor movie i kind of wish we had a female perspective on this episode (laughs) But I did, after after watching the show, I did kind of go online quickly and just see if I could find some female responses to see if it was something that maybe I just wasn't sensitive to and wasn't noticing, you know, how inappropriate it might be towards women. But there does seem to be a, a very large contingent of women who enjoys this movie as well and rates it quite highly. So uh, I kind of reconciled that with myself. So I think the, the sexual overtones... The, the, the potential sexual inappropriateness and the potential racial inappropriateness, I don't think it's over the line, and I think... I think the sexual humor was definitely more generalized. You had the uh, grandma really just talking about how hot uh, the love interest was, pointing out specific body parts and all that. You had the uh, creepy pedophile pilot, which... <laughs> Joey, have you ever been in a Turkish prison? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow, that... That is definitely pushing that envelope a little bit right there. And then, yeah, you have the wacky material and whatnot. Just the odd the odd reference to stuff. Though I did find uh, those two little kids that they brought on. The one checks out the other, comes by with some coffee later on. The girl's like eight, and she's like, I like my coffee black, like my men. And the other kid just stares at her for a second. They linger on his face. <laughs> Which I think is genius because she delivers it so straight. So not only do you have this line delivered from a child, but it's delivered so straight. And then they linger on the reaction of the boy next to her. And he's got the same reaction the audience does, (laughs) which is what? (laughs) Because I could see they were going for little kids acting sort of like adults with the whole politeness and all that. Bringing the drink and old 60s sort of style adults, I guess. I don't know how many disaster movies you've seen, but, you know, your movies like Poseidon Adventure and Towering Inferno and Airplane 75, they always kind of have, there's the the families, there's the, the kids who are, you know, unaccompanied minors. Like, they really did cover all the bases. There's that great line, <laughs> which now I can see, this is another one of those examples of uh, possibly inappropriate kind of humor when the flight attendant randy was talking about how she's never been this scared in her life and she's never been married and then that lady comes in and she's like well i've never been this scared in my life before but at least i have a husband (laughs) just to rub it in there which you know nowadays that line probably wouldn't fly in a movie no pun intended but i think in the context and i think you know taking this movie in the period that it was made and the fact that you know there's nothing grossly inappropriate about that however in 20 30 years will that advance to the point where it is <laughs> if we're still podcasting in 20 or 20 or 30 years we'll answer that question <laughs> or we'll be crotchety old men who don't know what uh what's inappropriate anymore and we go around saying ah oh, people with their pc these days and their brain implants and cyborg testicles i don't know why they'd have them but they do <laughs> <laughs> That just reminded me of that scene early on with the guy putting all of his metal parts up. <laughs> or Robert Stack with his line about getting kicked with like a metal boot or whatever. And then he's like, have you ever been down in the mud and had someone kick you in the head with a metal boot? Well, of course you haven't. No one has. It was a stupid question. You should ignore me. <laughs> and that's the, that's the kind of humor that I think is a bit more timeless. Stuff, stuff like that, that yes, it's a bit more absurdist, but it's not topical. It's not... Uh, it's not racial, it's not sexual, it's it's timeless. <laughs> I agree. I love the fact that there was jokes, I think there was two jokes that I'd never caught before in my entire life. Any of my previous viewings, and I've seen this movie a lot. This was, this was a regular go-to, uh, probably during most of my formative preteen and teen years. To revisit a movie this far into the future, I guess, uh, from where I was, and to be still finding jokes that I didn't catch and new things to laugh at, that impressed me. One thing I can say, though, 
tends to be, I don't know if it's a failing of uh, this kind of movie. Anytime anything is in the foreground volume wise or anything happens, you expect a joke because there's so many. And usually they will deliver. At the beginning when they're going, the white zone is for loading and unloading, no stopping in the red zone, and then that turns into an argument between uh, two people, which ends up in talking about how whether or not she should have gotten an abortion. <laughs> and they'll have... you. I heard it, where they repeated it a couple times, and I'm like, I'm waiting for this to turn into a joke now. And the same thing with the uh, guy coming up for with the uh, flower and offering it to the one woman, and nothing happens. And I'm like, there's going to be a joke in here somewhere. And so it keeps happening and happening. Though the final punchline where uh, Kramer comes in and just beats the crap out of everyone. (laughs) That was great. (laughs) That was just fantastic. But at the same time, that's a little topical because I've never had that experience in in an airport before. I've never even heard of it outside of movies. That was probably something, I mean, we both come from smaller Canadian cities. We don't have the Hari Krishna here. I didn't do extensive traveling as a as a young lad. I don't know about you, but that no. was probably something. I don't know, listeners, anybody who can verify that there was a lot of like Hare Krishnas and other religious folks hanging out in airports, handing out stuff. Let us know. I did catch that there was a Scientologist in there, though. There was. <laughs> There was. There was kind of everything in there by the end. There was a guy who was like, nuclear energy? <laughs> <laughs> Though I did love his flip around the guy. Like That was actually some good choreography. That was better choreography than I saw in a lot of fight movies around the same time. And I didn't see any editing. Like I think that was actually Robert Stack doing that. I couldn't see any any indication otherwise either, yeah. Didn't see any wires, any sort of flying shenanigans. I also realized uh, a lot of my memories about Airplane are more tied to the sequel, Airplane 2. Which I have never seen. Which is a, it's the exact same movie, only instead of an airport, it's a they're flying a shuttle from Earth to the moon, and he's got to crash land the shuttle on the moon. <laughs> and instead of Robert Stack, it's William Shatner. It has its great moments, but so many of the jokes that I thought I was going to see watching this movie are, are actually jokes from Airplane 2. So it was kind of nice sort of having that corrected for me. If there's one thing that uh, I would say usually wasn't very good or r- funny at all for the most part was anything involving the uh, the couple's relationship. That took me out and just made me say, okay, hurry up and get on with it. But that took they'll, you... The they'll pe- do the, <laughs> they do the flashbacks. They do the... Anytime they're talking, I just want to slap them. Shut up. <laughs> I think, I mean, it was supposed to be like that. Like, that's that expository scene that's in every movie that they're parodying. And everybody that has to listen to it ends up trying to kill themselves. Feeling like you do (laughs) (laughs) while watching it. The problem is when you do that for the third time, is it a parody or are you you becoming that which you hate? (laughs) Ooh, now the discussion is getting deep. (laughs) (laughs) Existential ramifications. What have we become? One thing you mentioned uh, as a small joke that I didn't quite get because I hadn't necessarily seen it, so just made whatever assumption, especially since it's an older movie, the sound of the twin prop airplane that they had running the entire time. The despite entire the fact that it's movie. A jet. <laughs> it's so subtle. If and you're I, not paying knew... attention, you just realize like halfway through the movie you've been listening to this prop plane sound. And that's the thing. I didn't know that it wasn't a twin prop plane or, sorry, a four propeller engine I don't know. I didn't see one way or the other, and I could see that being a joke that they would do. <laughs> you didn't notice that it was a big, white, beautiful plane with wings. Looks kind of like a Tylenol. <laughs> well, yeah, but did they used to have propellers? I don't know. This is 30-odd years ago. It's all good. The last stupid scene where uh, the autopilot comes back and then flies off the wreck. Fl- the wreck flies off again. I I don't know what that was. <laughs> it's just silly. Let's just bring in Otto, the autopilot, back. Did not care for Otto. Giving him a friend. No, no, I've never cared too much for Otto, but, you know, Otto's there. Face it. Accept it. That's life now. This is the world we live in. (laughs) (laughs) I like how the music sort of plays it straight, too. The score by Elmer Bernstein. He goes right for the, you know, typical disaster movie, 70s style. It doesn't go weirdly zany, for sure. There, There isn't any Mickey Mousing. It's, here's your disaster score. They occasionally will throw in something like the music from Staying Alive or, you know, whatever movie or, or commercial that they're parodying. 
which is kind of relevant to the pop culture of the time. But I think that's important. I think, the, I mean, the music, the jokes, it's, they're all there to set things up. And I, I don't know where I'm going with that. And I'm really distracted <laughs> by the crashing, clashing noises upstairs. For your consideration is filmed in front of a live studio audience. <laughs> <laughs> So jokes are good. Writing is sharp. These are masters at their craft. There's just as many smart jokes as there is like stupid, juvenile, absurdist jokes. But then we have the big question. Is it a masterpiece or a museum piece or neither? The thing is, certainly plot wise, there's not much to talk about. The movie is a series of jokes all strung together. It's it's what happens in a spoof movie. You'll get a bunch of references and then joke after joke after joke and an hour and a half goes by and it's finished. It does leave a lot less to be discussed, I think. I do think that this movie, as well as uh, another film that Zuckers and Abrams made, Top Secret, these two movies, I think there is like a half-decent plot. There is a half-decent story. There's oh, sort absolutely. Of, there's, there's characters with sort of an arc even if it is like a comedic arc, um, once you start getting into, I mean, the Airplane 2, the sequel, is just a rehash of the first movie. The two Hot Shots movies, obviously playing off of Top Gun and a bunch of like 80s war movies, 80s, 90s war movies. I don't remember them having much story to them other than just some very bare bones stuff. I kind of felt like Airplane had a little bit more meat on its bones. And I think that's that's also what I think helps legitimize the movie. Like, you almost don't realize that there's quite so much humor in it. 2.8 jokes a minute. <laughs> and that's assuming they got all the jokes. That's true. That's there could very be true. more. Hidden jokes. Stuff hiding in the background. Pay attention to the red phone. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea if that's, that counts things like uh, visual jokes. Um, like the woman who spoke jive. She, I believe, was the woman who played June Cleaver on Leave it to Beaver. So the, the joke there is not just that here's a woman, you know, an elderly white woman who speaks jive, but, you know, she's from Leave it to Beaver, which is total saccharine, white middle class sort of pop culture relic. So the ratio might actually be higher than 2.8 jokes per minute, but that's not for us to decide. If anybody else wants to do that calculation, feel free to let us know. <laughs> Because <laughs> that is way more time than I'm willing to waste. <laughs> if anybody wants to do that calculation, we'll think of some sort of suitable prize <laughs> to award the winning candidate. He will. I won't. Because I, that would also involve fact-checking to make sure that you got the correct numbers. More work I'm not willing to do. <laughs> Dustin's willing to watch the movies. And he's, he's willing to talk the movies. But I'm not willing to count every single joke against yours and figure out exactly when the movie starts and finishes to get these numbers. I'm lucky to just get Dustin to wear pants to these recordings. I'm at home. It is, <laughs> it is pants optional as far as I'm concerned, but I am a generous and benevolent overlord. What did you think of the joke? <laughs> okay, first off, the, the don't call me Shirley joke. That's, that's, that's a famous one. That's one that... I would almost expect. It's so overdone. I still laugh every time. I just love the delivery of it. It was done twice in the movie. That's it. And and the joke where it's like, we need you in the cockpit. The cockpit? What is it? It's a little room at the front of the airplane, but that's not important right now. <laughs> I, I can't not laugh at those jokes. The hospital, what is it? It's a building with sick people. <laughs> How did you feel about those? The, the Shirley joke I'd heard so many times that... I knew it was coming, and I didn't didn't really react to it. I did still enjoy the hospital. What is it? Jokes, because even even though they did it three times, I found it more amusing. It wasn't a laugh out loud moment, but it was one that I thought I like that. That's good. <laughs> I appreciate that they brought it back a few times, but at the same time, it's the same joke that you're doing. Less less marks each time, you know. It's an entirely different thing altogether. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's what happens. There's different. Is it a callback or is it rehash, rehashing the same joke? I think the fact that they keep coming back to it and it doesn't get bigger and it doesn't get smaller. It's like it's the same tone. It's the same delivery. You know, everybody, it's just an in-world thing. I think that maintains the, the quality of it. It doesn't get old. Debates that I have about whether or not it's as funny as it should be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I guess I don't really have anything else to say. So before you can throw it to me, I'm going to throw it to you. What do you think? Oh, you want me to go first? Okay. Um, <laughs> you know what? I 
as I said, uh, what, I had a concept of what I thought I was going to say, and then I kind of deliberated with that because of some of the content, and I was wondering, does that, you know, knock it down? Should I reconsider it? But I think what they did with this movie, this film has been influencing other films for decades, other filmmakers, and it does what it does so well that I, I have to vote masterpiece. I, I was just going to go like classic comedy, but I'm going to say this is this is a masterpiece. This is this is like the best of its kind. And see, one of the reasons I wanted you to go first is because I knew you were waffling a little bit, going back and forth a bit, whereas I was pretty set in stone about a half hour in because I, I was deliberating as we were watching. And as I was talking about earlier, you have so many of the jokes are topical, are ones that sort of uh, push the envelope on what is or is not good taste. They throw in so many things that would just be possibly bigoted and small-minded throughout the film, depending on how sensitive you are to that. And I know I was a little on the, like, is is this too far, as we were saying earlier? But it is a hugely influential mu- movie, and there is still a lot of funny stuff in it. But I also wonder how much of that I got simply because of my age, and because I understood what references they're going for, I would call it a museum piece. Something that is definitely worth watching, but that's worth watching not for itself as an academic endeavor, more so than just, hey, little 10-year-old kid, watch this movie, it's funny. I don't know what the younger generation these days would say about it. (laughs) See, I agree. I think it would be interesting to see this with somebody younger, I never did watch this movie with my kids. I do think now that, you got homework. <laughs> I do think I, I think that a lot of this movie, you know, there's probably like dozens of pop culture references that you didn't catch. Like the he never has a second cup of coffee at home. You probably didn't know that that was based on an old coffee commercial. I have no idea. No. <laughs> I was like, what is what is she going for? Does she think he's cheating on her? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> so I mean, that still plays. It still has this weird sort of absurd quality to it. It will still play. I think to any audience, it it will have varying degrees of of quality of humor, I guess, depending on how much you know about sort of its pop cultural place in history. And that's always a risk that comes with topical humor. As far as I'm concerned, if you focus too much on that, you're foregoing any chance of being a masterpiece and relegating yourself to museum at best. I agree. And that's that's one of the things I deliberate, deliberated on for a while because I was ready to, you know, firmly place this as a museum piece until we hit the end. And I kind of realized that, you know, like I said earlier on, I mean, comedy is supposed to sort of push boundaries and, you know, lean into the lines. And I don't think this movie crossed any really serious lines and taking it in the context of which it was made. And the fact that even... Even some of the jokes that at the time would have been considered totally broad uh, in the sense that, you know, like the coffee commercial. Everybody would have known the coffee commercial. Or the Jaws reference right at the beginning before the opening titles comes. You know, somebody who maybe hasn't seen Jaws and isn't thinking about the, you know, John Williams music that they're playing, they might not catch that, but they might still think it's kind of funny just in the absurdity of it. So so for me, that's why I would argue against Museum Peace and just to give a more well-rounded kind of argument in response to your position. Well, I guess we'll have to agree to only partially agree. <laughs> All right, so that's one vote for Museum Piece and one vote for Masterpiece. We'd love to hear what you think of the movie. Feel free to let us know in the comments on our Facebook page. You can also send us a tweet on Twitter. We are at FYC Show over there. Uh, subscribe, follow. You can also find us on Instagram. And if you know anybody who gets the, their podcasts off of iHeartRadio or Stitcher, we are available through those providers. And if you get your show off of iTunes, as so many people do, while you're there, it only takes a minute, rate and review the show. We'd love to hear what you think. Uh, any comments that we get either you know, on Facebook, Twitter, or iTunes reviews, we will gladly share those on a future episode of the podcast. And if we get any reviews or comments in the mail, then we will be very concerned. We would be concerned as to how they got our mail, mailing address. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks again so much for joining us. Uh, be sure to catch us next time when we cover uh, what's sure to be another amazing film in the cinematic canon of past masterpieces in modern classics or a piece of crap film that like uh six cents wasn't as good as it was rated i'm mike Josek, and i'm dustin friesen take care Ta-ta.
Enough with unimportant BS that's just killing time. 